We'll come back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, globalist working on declaring Martian law. We got that story. But we also got some good news coming out of Okinawa, Japan. But first, some good news. If you're Israel, that is, as U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice said the proposed military aid package to Israel is larger than any the United States has ever offered to any country. Under the headline, America's $40 billion aid package to Israel is largest ever. The 10-year aid program would give Israel up to $40 billion to upgrade its military aircraft and missile defense systems to defend against rocks, I mean militants in Lebanon and the Gaza Strip and Al-Qaeda and Islamic State affiliates in Syria and Egypt. Speaking back on June 7th in Washington to the American Jewish Committee Global Forum, Rice said the pact would constitute a significant increase in support. With $3.1 billion in 2015, Israel is the biggest beneficiary of U.S. foreign aid. Officials from Israel and the United States have said a $4 billion package for 2016 is under consideration. I think, in a way, we see these signs and we see the amount of money always kind of going overseas. I, I, I tend to think about this when I walk down a city street and I see sort of the crumble and decay. And you go, oh, well, billions of dollars to other nations. James? I want, yeah, I want to say, I mean, this is insane, but that actually presupposes that there is actually supposed to be some sort of logic to this. There isn't. There is no logic to this. It is the Israeli tail wagging the American dog, as usual, and it is $40 billion. $40 billion. So from now on, let's set a new rule, not to be Bill Maher, <laughs> but let's set a new rule. Any time any politician for any reason says that they are having any budgetary problems meeting any sort of their uh, budget requirement, how about American citizens say, $40 billion to Israel, we have the money, it's right there, there's $40 billion. Never mind the, uh, how many trillion is it now that's been missing from the Pentagon over the past 15 years, eight, eight and a half trillion, whatever it is. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a total farce. It's a total farce. Um, it's not insane because that, again, presupposes it's, there is some sort of underlying logic or sanity to it. It is just completely from a different universe. Anyone who isn't outraged by this is not paying attention. And as you say, who are the deadly existential threat that Israel is defending themselves from? Is it the b bottle rockets from Lebanon? Because that's pretty much it. There are no Al-Qaeda attacks on Israel, and there are no ISIS attacks on Israel, because as even mainstream Israeli press admits, not only does ISIS not attack Israel, Israel actively takes care of ISIS fighters in Israeli hospitals. Again, that is mainstream Israeli press. Uh, so it's just total, utter nonsense. It's garbage. And uh, anyone who isn't outraged isn't paying attention. And is it maybe some element of, you know, like the banksters, you know, fund all the sides and essentially see who's going to pull out in front? Because at the same time, there's all kinds of money for bombs to kill little kids going to the Saudis and all just – there's enough war chest money to just sort of helicopter around as they seem to do. James will include links for that story you just mentioned. I haven't seen that, that ISIS, ISIS fighters being treated in Israeli hospitals. And we'll also include, of course, more weapons for the Saudis. And James, even actually Haaretz noted. And again, we always include all the links. Everything we say and mention will be included in the show notes. Haaretz had the headline of, despite some, you know, some objections, Israel to get $40 billion. Because Susan Rice did say, well, you know, I've got some problems with some of the settlements and some, you know, little, little iffy, little tiny things, little quibbles. No big deal. Our second story this week on New World Next Week, episode 274 for June 23rd, 2016. The government of Mars is already being planned. An amazing piece on Activist Post. As NASA tech billionaires and other nonprofit organizations all vie to colonize the stars, with a particular eye on Mars as humanity's next home, researchers in Seattle recently offered a glimpse of what government on the red planet could look like. But first, as far back as 2010, outlined in the U.S. national space policy and then given the budgetary green light by the NASA Authorization Act, the United States has advanced the idea that Americans could be living on Mars by the Agenda 2030s. 
A major milestone towards this end would be streamlining the ability to land human beings on an asteroid, which they hope to do by 2025. A habitable set settlement will await the first crew before they depart Earth, Mars One says in their mission statement. The hardware needed will be sent to Mars in the years ahead of the humans. This unmanned mission currently scheduled for 2024. But as more time, energy, capital devoted to establishing a human presence on Mars, many are asking how the body governing such a colony will function. One such group in Seattle, the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, has recently penned a report addressing that very question. The report titled, A Pragmatic Approach to Sovereignty on Mars, and published in Space Policy, borrows from three already established treaties, the Antarctic Treaty System, ATS, our favorite Outer Space Treaty, OST, and the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. The governing body proposed by the Blue Marble Institute is called the Mars Secretariat. As the name implies, this body would be a weak central authority whose purview would primarily be administrative, record maintenance, secretarial duties, and the like. Manha Martian inhabitants themselves would wield significant local power. Legally, however, this power would be derived from the inhabitants' host nations with conflicts to be resolved diplomatically or through a temporary tribunal system composed of representatives of other Mars colonies. The Outer Space Treaty states that, quote, the exploration of use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries and shall be the province of all mankind, end quote. To this end, the report further proposes the establishment of planetary parks and a Mars tax. Quotes from the future, James. Ah, that damn Mars tax really burns my ass, you know? It's just they're always taking money from me. I think in a lot of ways we can see that on New World Next Week, when people were still talking about tasers, we were talking about drones. And hopefully in a lot of ways we look towards the future in that sort of next week way. So we're off to Mars. You know, James, of all of the really horrible, sad, depressing news that we've covered over the years, I don't think any story is as fundamentally depressing to me as a story that says that human beings literally can't even think about theoretically going to a new place without the thought immediately following, hmm, I wonder what government we can set up there. Just how, uh, how, how utterly sad is that? What an indictment of the human species that we can't possibly even contemplate the idea of a new frontier, a real new frontier, frontier mentality. I'm sure you have had, I know I have had, the fantasy of a frontier, the place you can go to escape all this insanity. No, no, don't even think about that. We have to think about how we can bring this insanity to the next place that we're going to go. So... How utterly sad, and one can only hope that by the time we do get there that, uh, well, we'll have found a way to break from, from this. Um, if people are looking for, I want to say more hopeful, or at least a different way of thinking about this situation, I will highly encourage them to check out my conversation on The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. It's a book by Robert Heinlein um, about the moon as a penal colony that um, is essentially a functioning anarchic state. And then they have a revolution that kind of puts in a government. So it's kind of a sad story, but it's an interesting, it's a fascinating look at the way an anarchic society could actually function. And it, it, it's really fascinating. And I had a conversation with David Friedman about that book on film literature in the New World Order earlier this year. So we'll put that in the show notes. But uh, again, what a, what a sad indictment of the human species that we can't possibly think of a place without thinking about how government would function there. So we began in Israel, then we launched off to outer space. We'll land back on Earth for our third and final story this week as Okinawa residents rally to protest crimes by U.S. military personnel. This comes via the Manichi. Tens of thousands of Okinawa prefecture residents rallied Sunday to voice their anger about crimes committed by U.S. military personnel while demanding a drastic review of how such incidents are handled following the recent alleged murder of a 20-year-old local woman by a civilian U.S. base worker. The protesters, many dressed in black, totaling 65,000, according to organizers, even some mainstream media accounts, if you can find them, will say even it was at least 50,000. They braved scorching heat to gather at a park in the prefectural capital of Naha in one of the largest demonstrations against U.S. military bases. This article says in recent years, I think it's more like 20. Many held signs that read, Marines withdraw and our anger has reached the limit. 
in reference to a spate of crimes committed by U.S. military-linked personnel, despite preventative measures taken to enforce stricter discipline. Critics say the 1960 Status of Forces Agreement, which has never been revised, gives undue protection to U.S. servicemen and base employees. Some local residents believe the accord fosters crimes and preventative measures such as curfews or enforcement of stricter discipline are ineffective. While Japan and the United States are reviewing to clarify the legal status of civilian workers subject to SOFA, that's the the Status of Forces Agreement, experts and some local residents view an overhaul of the pact as a tall order. A 38-year-old resident of Yoruma, where the victim lives, and a mother of three said that if SOFA cannot be changed, getting rid of the bases entirely from Okinawa or from mainland Japan to share the base hosting burden may be the answer. Well, by George, I think we may have hit upon the answer. Get rid of the military base. How about that? James? It would be nice. Um, it ain't going to happen, but it would be nice. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And, and let's let's flesh that out a little because you say the biggest protests in 20 years. Yes, specifically since 1995 when three American servicemen raped a 12-year-old girl in Okinawa. Uh, so definitely not the first time that we've had people connected with the bases uh, attacking killing, raping um, people there. So uh, understandably, the Okinawans are pretty upset about that. And so this has been an issue, I mean, at least since 1995. They've been talking about relocating the bases or closing the bases. It hasn't happened in 20 plus years. It's not going to happen, especially now that they're ramping up the new Cold War nonsense with China. Um, And Okinawa becomes even more strategic. And let's not lose sight of the fact in all of this, the Okinawan people are mere, if if not not even pawns in this game, they're almost like obstacles. They're just kind of in the way of the U.S. military plans here. And uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that Okinawa is its own island with its own culture, its own history, its own people, that it was forcefully assimilated into Japan and paid the price of a quarter of its population dying during the uh, the World War II as uh, Okinawa was invaded. And now it, has, uh, ha- it bears the brunt of 74% of all U.S. servicemen in Japan are stationed in Okinawa, 50,000 Americans in all. And uh, they're getting raped and murdered by uh, American servicemen or people connected with the bases. And they just have to sit there and take it. And politicians will come and deliver mealy mouth platitudes and nothing will change. Speaking of which, as we record this on Thursday, June 23rd here in Japan, uh, later today, uh, Prime Minister Abe is going to be in Okinawa to deliver a speech commemorating the 71st anniversary of the end of World War II in Okinawa. But uh, And he'll probably deliver some mealy mouth platitudes about the burdens that the ok- Okinawan people have to face with these bases. But it ain't going to change anything, and he's not even planning to meet with the governor of Okinawa um, to discuss the possibility of further relocation or closing of bases. So again, there's there's no real political impetus here. It is good that the people of Okinawa are upset about this. They are paying attention, but unfortunately, I don't see any change to this in the near future. A little bit of good news, hopefully, where we can find it. The latest episode of Good News next week is up on my own YouTube channel, Media Monarchy. Radio wins when all else fails about the power of ham, a.k.a. amateur radio. When everything else craps out, ham radio will still be there, and it is thriving. We also talk about the lowering confidence in all your institutions and a music camp for the blind in West Virginia. Now, some of the other stories we're looking at using hashtag New World Next Week. We begin with a headline from one of our New World Next Week tweeters. He had this story days before Infowars had it at Bohemian Grove, tweeted some screen grabs showing makeup professionals and actors sought for a Vermont drill, which happens to overlap with the Democratic National Convention coming up in July. Meanwhile, some of the other stories that we have been watching and will re-include the link to James, your Orlando shooting open source investigation as the drips and drabs of the Omar Mateen Orlando story continue to fall apart. Some of the saddest of which being when you learn that some of the cops probably shot a lot of the people in the Pulse Club. We learned that Barry would not get off of Air Force One until Game 7 of Shooty Hoops was over. Mark Zuckerberg puts tape over his laptop camera. I think that's the second little elite crony we find who loves to gather up all of your information but doesn't want to give any of their own. Was it Comey, I think, who also puts the puts the tape over his laptop? And the CIA-backed startup Crystal Ball 
that we talked about on this show back in January of this year. So their CEO is named Alex Karp, and the company is called Palantir. He, of course, attended Bilderberg, and they are in the news, as all Bilderberg-related things seem to be in the weeks after the conference. Secretive $20 billion startup Palantir buying $225 million of stock back from their employees in exchange for their complete silence about anything and everything they're doing behind the scenes. We also had, of course, the death of Joe Cox surrounding the upcoming Brexit vote, which will pretty much be underway by the time everybody is watching this right now. At I is bloke Twitter astutely noted that back on 9-11-2003, a Swedish minister died after a stabbing, which was related to Sweden, whether or not they were going to join the EU. So we see these things pop up time and time again, and we're going to see it pop up again. Lots of tribalism, lots of phony shows, and if you want to follow along, James, you have another open source investigation. You got the Brexit open thread for all the latest referendum news. And all I'd say is whatever happens, we remember that it's mostly a war on your psyche. That's what we've been saying for the last decade in our listener-supported work, and hopefully you will continue to support our work. And a slight correction for the nitpickers in the audience. Uh, The Swedish minister stabbing was in relation to a referendum that was taking place about Sweden joining the Euro uh, Monetary Union, the joining the Ah. Euro, not the EU. So, and (laughs) I did have a correction on my previous video that someone was kind (laughs) enough to send in about something I said wrong in relation to Anne Lynn's story. So people can check that. That's in the, uh, the, the comments for that video. Anyway, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you again for these stories. We'll do it again next week. All right, man. Take care.